Hey everybody, here we are in downtown Portsmouth, just about to interview a whole bunch of people on what they think about judging other people. It's gonna be a lot of fun, so come on, let's go interview. We're going around just asking people, what do they think about judging others? Well, one would hope that you shouldn't be judgmental of others, obviously, because there's nobody like yourself, so everybody's gotta be so different. But I think even as you walk down the street, you're making judgments whether you would like somebody's face or, you, I, I think it's a natural thing. Well, obviously it's a very complicated question. It all depends on what you're judging somebody on. I mean, if it's just generally meeting somebody for the first time and making a judgment, I think that, you know, we probably shouldn't do that. We all do, but I think we probably shouldn't. I think it depends on their actions, really. I mean, like, it's hard to be in a place to really judge someone unless you know what they're going through exactly, but I think certain people definitely if their actions are questionable, mm. can deserve to be looked at in a judgmental manner. The number one thing is, who are you to judge anybody? Number one. And number two, nine times out of 10, you don't have enough information to judge anybody. I don't believe so. Everybody is different. Everybody has their own way of doing things. Um, what might be good for one person may not work for somebody else, you know. I, just, I don't feel that people should judge others unless they know that person. If our country had no judicial system, what kind of a country do you think we'd live in? It would probably be pretty crazy. Unfortunately, I don't think people would monitor themselves. I don't think everybody has the same ethics or the mm. same moral convictions, so yeah. it would be chaos. I don't know. I think people would police themselves. I would tend to think that people would be the better and it would work itself out, but you don't know. People inherently you know their their base their their base gut core are good I feel like maybe people would be happier but sometimes i don't know maybe things could get a little out of hand set structure no set laws no set rules you know and people just allowed to go out and do whatever they wanted whenever they wanted to to whoever they wanted to do it to it would it would be you know be anarchy so what's perhaps a, a helpful judgment and maybe a not helpful judgment? Uh, how do you distinguish between the two? Well, probably surface stuff isn't helpful. I mean, if you can't help something, you can't help something, and you, you yeah. shouldn't be judged on anything. Yeah. I think you can teach kindness. You have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. I'd say that's a feeling. Judgment is necessary, but like then there's certain types that falls into unnecessary, you know. I think it will come down to the individual person. There's there's a difference between making a judgment when you have the facts, you know, and making like a like a snap judgment or you know judging a book by its cover. Yeah, I feel like it's in human nature to judge people. Like everyone, you know, I hear like you shouldn't judge people, but you really think about it, you're judging people every day. Having said what I said before, in all honesty. I find myself, and she, and she calls me out another time, but I call my, catch myself judging people all the time. Yeah. Interesting, huh? What do you think about judging others? <clears throat> I love going downtown Portsmouth and just interviewing people because you never know what you're going to find. Uh, you find all sorts of different kinds of people, and young, old, men, women, conservative, liberal, and you just get a variety of responses every single time. I mean, thoughts were all over the map, right? <laughs> How, what do you think of judging other people? Did you hear some of the contradictions? Some of the inconsistencies and in thoughts along the way? I, I don't know what you guys heard, but this is what I heard. Nobody should ever judge, but some people deserve it. <laughs> now, it'd be better if we lived without rules, but we'd be living in chaos. Without a judicial system, people would probably police themselves, but no one has the same moral convictions, so it'd be crazy. People are inherently good, but we're afraid they might not be. <laughs> we should never judge, but we do it all the time. Judgment is always bad, but sometimes it's good. <laughs> Did you catch some of that? <laughs> all right, here, here's the interesting thing. We struggle with judgment in America. We, we just really don't understand how, how, to, how to really grasp judgment. We really struggle with it. Um, we, we're not sure whether it's a swear word <laughs> or whether it's necessary, or perhaps it's both. Um, you know, we're, we're just, it's kind of like a hot topic. It's a really hot button, um, but we, we, we don't want to live with it. We don't want to be judged, and yet we can't live without it. 
<laughs> it's kind of a strange thing. So how do we understand judgment? How do we really wrestle with this? Well, the reality is, hundreds of years ago, if, if I did the same exact interview, we'd get very, very different responses. See, hundreds of years ago, people took morality and they used it to help discipline their desires to reality. You know, they, they thought that our desires were a little bit unstable. Maybe uh, they mislead us. Maybe they misguide us a little bit. So we have to use morality to try to get us to adhere to this moral code that everyone ought to, to live by, like an absolute standard. That's what they did hundreds of years ago. So they used morality to, to discipline themselves. Now, in comes the modern era. And with the modern era came this newfound confidence that we had to try to uh, own the world, you know, control the world in a sense. We had the Industrial Revolution, we had science, and, and there was this new confidence that, yeah, maybe we can control this world. But it extended not just to the physical world, it extended also to morality. Perhaps we can control morality. So instead of using morality to uh, conform our desires to meet reality, we decided now, well, why don't we just try to conform reality to meet our desires? This is now the postmodern thought that <clears throat> a lot of us live with today. Um, morality is really relative to the individual person. That's what a lot of people think. So <clears throat> the bottom line in all of this is that people want to make their own choices. They want to believe whatever they want to believe. They want to live however they want to live. And yet, they want the assurance of accountability knowing that other people aren't going to infringe on their own lifestyle, right? You can't live without both, or you can't live with both. So here's the question I want us to wrestle with today. <clears throat> How do we live in a world where people are inevitably going to be crossing our boundaries? What do we do when people inevitably misbehave and when we have conflicts with our mindset and our behaviors and our beliefs with other people? When they inevitably conflict, how are we supposed to handle that? In other words, how do we judge correctly? Today we're going to look at Matthew chapter 7 in our ongoing series here on this upside down kingdom, looking at what Jesus teaches us on how we are to live within the kingdom of God. And what he's going to do is he's going to give us a second look at judgment. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Jesus says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. <clears throat> Seems simple enough, right? All right, I think Jesus has settled the answer for us. You guys can all go home. We're just not supposed to judge at all, right? Now, if we take it at face value like that and just say we're never supposed to judge ever, 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 we'd probably have to throw out all laws, all standards, all discipline, and those of you who are parents in the room say, yeah, that's not happening in my house. Because I know exactly what would happen if my kids had no discipline, no rules, no standards. It'd be chaos, right? And we heard that from some of the videos as well. <clears throat> so if we live in a world where, where we need judgment, why does Jesus say, do not judge? Now, not only would we live in a world that's a bit chaotic, but we'd actually have to throw out a good chunk of scripture if we took it to that extreme. Even within the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus has been teaching us from Matthew 5 through chapter 7, he's been telling us, look, you, you know this way of living. You've heard that it was said, but I tell you, and then he tells us a different way to live. You can't do that unless you're making judgment calls, unless you're making value judgments on a certain way of living that was wrong and needs correction, and Jesus is telling us how we ought to live in the real, in, in his kingdom. You can't make that without judgment calls. Now, you might be thinking, well, Jesus is God. <clears throat> he can tell us how to live. If there's anybody who can tell us how to live, how to correct certain behaviors and live a certain way, it's Jesus. But he doesn't stop there. He tells us to start making some judgment calls as well. He says, don't be like the hypocrites when it comes to giving, when it comes to fasting, when it comes to prayer, because their actions don't match up with their words. Now, we don't know who hypocrites are, unless we're trying to, to watch the inconsistency between how people speak and how people live, right? We have to make those judgment calls. We have to in order to understand what hypocritical living is. Now, G, the, the scripture actually goes on in, in 1 Corinthians to say that we ought to judge our brothers. That, that's part of what it means to be in the body of Christ. We ought to judge each other, which is interesting because in Romans 14 and James 4, it says, hey, don't judge. <laughs> so what do we do with all this? 
It's, it's seemingly like scripture is con conflicting with each other, and we just wrestle with this word judgment. So how do we handle all of this? Well, the reality is Jesus is not throwing out all forms of judgment. This is really, really important, okay? Catch this. In verse 2, he says, For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He's saying there are certain kinds of judgment, and maybe even more importantly, how you judge that you need to be careful of. And here's the point. There's, there's a variety of different kinds of judgments here. There's a judgment that says, I'm going to critically evaluate a certain situation. And there's a judgment that says, I'm going to condemn you. I'm looking at you for who you are, and I'm already making judgments about your character and your heart and your motives. It's a big difference between the two of them there. Some of the differences here between critical evaluation, you could say, are this. Um, harsh judgment, condemning judgment, looks at someone who's got tattoos and instantly assumes they've got issues. Whereas uh, critical assessment looks at someone with a gun in their hands and says, yeah, there might be some danger there. See the difference? Harsh judgment, condemning judgment says, uh, There's, uh, this person never talks to me. They must hate me. Whereas critical evaluation says, this person just said something hurtful to me. Maybe we ought to have a conversation. Harsh judgment sees a child who's a bit upset in the grocery store and says, oh man, there's got to be parenting issues. No question about it. I hope you're not judging me because uh, if you follow us in the grocery store, watch out. Whereas critical judgment sees someone abusing their child and says, hey, something ought to be done there. You see the difference? Critical judgment watches some actions and says, hey, maybe we ought to do something about this. And harsh condemning judgment looks at motives and hearts. Last I checked, only God was able to do that. I thought about this today. <laughs> I thought about actually coming up here in tattered jeans and in a sleeveless shirt and like a dog collar around my neck and showing you my, my tattooed sleeves up and down my arms um, just to just see if you guys would judge me or not. Now, I'm not going to tell you if I have tattooed sleeves or not because I'll get you thinking, are you going to judge? You know? <laughs> I may, I may not. Okay, so there's, there's two different kinds of judgment. When I was, um, when I was growing up, I kind of felt these two different kinds of judgment. Um, when I was eight years old, uh, my whole family came to Christ. It was a radical change. The love of Jesus just totally penetrated us. And one of the decisions my parents made was to pull us out of school and homeschool us. So I was homeschooled from third grade all the way through high school. Um, I loved homeschooling. It was a great experience. But one of the outlets I had was still to be able to play sports at the public high school. I love sports. I love competing. But it's interesting. Uh, I had some great experience and some, some great friends. But as a Christian homeschool kid, I also ran into some interesting issues. For people that didn't know me, and for me to jump onto the team, it was easy for them to say, oh, look at the homeschool kid. He's got to be weird. He's got to have some social issues, right? That's why he's out of school. Or he's Christian. Be careful what you say around him. Don't swear, because he'll probably judge you. OK? Harsh, condemning judgment that had no idea who I am but would start judging me before I get out of the field. Now, that's one f form of judgment. The other form is this. Sometimes throughout the season, my play was just not where it should have been. You know, I needed correction in how I was to play. So my teammates and my coach would come alongside me and help me perform better, help me be a better teammate. And sometimes when I got caught in the, uh, the competition, sometimes I'd start losing my temper. It was important for my teammates and my coach to come alongside me in moments like that and correct my behavior, right? That's a healthy kind of judgment. So we know what it's like. Every single one of us knows what it's like to really have critical evaluation, someone coming alongside us and helping us, and other people judging us from a distance. You see, condemning harsh judgment does this. It looks at us objectively, stands at a distance, and says, I think I know who you are, and I'm going to assume you've got bad motives. I'm going to assume some, some bad things about you even before I know you. You know what it's like. You've walked into a room where you instantly felt judged, and you feel about this big. You, you feel like you're, you're walking on eggshells, and you, could, you can never do anything to actually please this person. Because this person already has you pinned and tagged uh, and, and will never think anything good of you. In fact, this person is going to find whatever they can, even the, the most minute flaw, and just pounce on it. So you just, you're tense, you know? It's, it's hard to be judged in a condemning manner. But we all know what it feels like. Why do people judge in this manner? Why do we? 
because I think we're all tempted to do it, right? I think it's a defense mechanism. I think it's based out of fear. Some insecurity on our part that we feel threatened by someone else. And so we're going to act on it. We're going to judge. We're going to put some distance between us and the other person because they pose a threat to us. Whether their threat is because they're, they're successful and we don't want to feel this big next to them. Or possibly because they have some faults, different ways of thinking and behaving, and we just we, we want to stay as far away from that as possible. Harsh, condemning judgment always puts distance between us and them, but it assumes, too, that we have grounds, we have the authority to be able to judge them in a condemning manner. Jesus says, if you assume this, you're acting out of hypocrisy, and this is why. Verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your, out of your eye and then you'll be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus makes the point here that we have no grounds, no authority, we have nothing to be able to judge someone in this harsh and condemning manner. Why? Because all of us have fallen away from grace to a really far extent. Every one of us at one point had a broken relationship with God that needed fixing. And his, his point is this. He, ma he makes a ridiculous uh, analogy to kind of drive home his point. Um, and he, he, he pictures people who are looking intently for this speck in someone's eye. Uh, a lot of your translations have speck. Some of them have moat. Um, I don't know if you guys know what a moat is, M-O-T-E. I had no idea what it is, so I had to go look it up. It's like a fraction of a fraction of a particle. It's tiny. Really, really, really tiny. In, in order to even find this, you got to put it under an intense microscope, you know, a huge magnifying glass to even see it. So, I mean, you picture someone looking for a, a speck or a moat in someone's eye. They have to be like an inch away from someone's face. You know, you talk about invading personal space, you know, like that close. And they're like examining, examining, examining. Where is that hidden fault? Where is that tiny thing? All the while, you got a two by four sticking out of your face. Now, Jesus' point is this. You can't find a speck in someone's eye if you got a two-by-four sticking out there. Like, it's just impossible. You're going to be staring at wood, you know, not someone's eye. What his point is this. If you're looking for this, if you're looking for the hidden faults in someone else, if you're going out of your way to try to find these hidden faults, blindness has set. You can't see correctly. Why? Because every single one of us are sinners and in need of grace. Our King David, um, years and years ago, once said this, after examining his own heart, he said, uh, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Another psalm says uh, that there is no one who does good. Every single one of us have turned away from God. Scripture makes it very clear that every single one of us were at fault. Uh, Paul goes on it and, and says, uh, we, at one time we were dead just dead in our transgressions and our sins. We were without God and without hope in the world. And that just doesn't characterize some of us. That characterizes every single one of us in this room. If that's true, if every single one of us are in need of that kind of grace in order to be able to, to stand, in order to be able to reconcile this broken relationship that we have with God, the, the, where, where sin and rebellion entered, there was this great chasm between us and God. If every single one of us are in that situation, what grounds do we have to, be, to, to actually be able to stare at someone in the eye and look for the, the tiniest flaw when all of us have the chasm between us and God? You have no grounds. And so Jesus' point is this. Take a look at your heart. Take a look at your motives. Why are you judging someone else? Understand that every one of us have fallen so far from grace. And when you understand that, then you'll be able to see clearly with other people. You'll, you'll be clothed with compassion and with humility. Here's the interesting part. After understanding that we've fallen so far from grace, that doesn't mean that we should not judge at all. <laughs> Let me take a look at this. He says, first, take the plank out of your own eye. Examine your heart. Examine your life. Know how far you've fallen from grace. Then, then, you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Did you catch that? 
Jesus still wants us to engage life with other people. And he still wants us to be able to help people out, to be able to see those, those flaws in other people, walk alongside them and help them. But it changes everything when you understand how far from grace you've fallen, doesn't it? The motives and the reason for why you look at someone else's flaws totally changes. Instead of judging them and putting distance between you and them, it forces you to come close to them and says, let me help you. Let me help you. Because the reality is this. We judge correctly when we seek the good of others. We judge correctly when we seek the good of others. Jesus wants us to help our brothers and sisters out in Christ. He wants us to. He knows that we're all sinners, that we all make mistakes, that we're far from perfect, and we need someone to come alongside us and put an arm around us and say, hey, this way of life is not working for you. You need to change some things here. But he wants to do it not out of a sense of condemning. He wants us to do it out of a sense of care. Care for your brothers and sisters. Now, when, when conflicts arise, and they inevitably will, between you and someone else, whether it's your thoughts or your behaviors or, or your beliefs, when conflicts arise between you and, and someone else, we, we try to control the situations. Um, and Jesus is saying, don't control it out of judging. But there's another way that we try to control situations. When that conflict arises between us and someone else, we can also seek to reform them. We can also seek to try to change their lives. And Jesus is going to tell us, you cannot occupy the throne of judgment because there's only one ultimate judge. Neither can you occupy the throne of salvation because there's only one Savior. Take a look at this. Verse 6. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they'll trample them under their feet and they'll turn and tear you to pieces. Then you're thinking, well, what does that have to do with anything you just said? Um, dogs and pigs. What are dogs and pigs? Dogs and pigs uh, were, were animals that were looked at as very unclean. They were dirty and they were dangerous. You stay far away from them because in, in the, the Hebrew system, in the Jewish system, it was all about purity. You know? We had to be pure before God. So what they did is they actually looked at Gentiles, those who were not in the family of God, and they refer to them sometimes as dogs and pigs. Now, Jesus is using this illustration here. He's using these words to say that there are some people in this world who are just incredibly hard-hearted, very hard-hearted. And no matter how much care you exercise in their life, no matter how much love you, you give them, and no matter how much you tell them about this good news that Jesus wants to reconcile our relationship between us and him and our relationships with others, no matter how much you extend that to them, they're still going to be hard-hearted. They're still going to put up this front and say, no, thank you. They can still reject it. And Jesus is making this point. Don't force that issue. Don't force it. Because you cannot occupy the throne of judgment as the ultimate judge. Neither can you occupy the throne of salvation because there's only one Savior. Jesus, when he sent out a whole bunch of people to preach this message of repentance to the kingdom, he said, hey, if you're received well, stay at that house. If you are not received well, shake the dust off your sandals. It's okay to go because their lives are in my hands. They're not in yours. We love to try to control people, control people through judgment or try to control people through reforming them. But we have to understand we're not the ultimate judge and we are not the ultimate savior. And we judge correctly when we seek the good of others, not forcing it and not judging people. Now, with this correct understanding that Jesus has given us here, he's telling us to seek the good of others. But how do we do that? We live in a, a vulnerable world here where there's, there's going to be conflicts, there's going to be hurts, and there's going to be pains. What resources do we have? What tools does Jesus give us to really be able to judge correctly and seek the good of other people? Well, he's going to show us how. He's going to show us the tools. He's going to give us some resources here. And it all has to come down with our relationship with God. He's going to show us who is this God that loves you. Verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you, Jesus says. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if he has a son that asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father in heaven 
give good gifts to those who ask him. Back in the ancient days, um, when people developed gods, when they, when they came up gods for themselves, um, they came under this understanding that there's all sorts of things that we need to do in order to earn the favor of the gods. There's all sorts of things that we needed to do to appease the gods. So they, they did all sorts of random, wacky things to be able to appease the gods because they thought if we don't appease them, if we don't do the right things, then somehow uh, we're going to incur their wrath. Things are just not going to go well with us. Our crops are not going to produce crops. We're not going to bear children. We're not going to be successful. We need to just do all these kind of things. Otherwise, it's just not going to go well for us. So um, they would do all sorts of random things. You know, they'd, they'd perform rituals. They'd have all sorts of cults. You know, they'd prostrate themselves on the ground. They would sacrifice animals. They, they'd sacrifice sometimes their children. They would kill neighboring enemies. All of this thought just to appease the gods and satisfy their wrath somehow. Now, if that's the kind of system that you think you need to live in in order to, to make life go well for you, what are those gods like? What's their character like? The wrathful, vindictive, uncaring, demanding, they're not satisfied themselves. They, they ask and ask and ask and barely give back. Is that the kind of God you want to serve? Is that the kind of lifestyle you want to live? Always living in fear, wondering, what do I got to do to appease this God? Jesus paints a radically different picture of the God of heaven. He says, ask. Just ask, and it'll be given to you. Just search for God, and you'll find him. Just knock on that door and he's going to be right there. We get this promise littered throughout Scripture that the God of heaven, the one who created all of the universe, the one who, was always, who always has been and always will be, he is near to us. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found, and you will find him. We get this promise that all who call on the name of the Lord will find him. That even if we just confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, he will, he will give us salvation. This is the kind of God we serve. He's not a distant God. He's not a, a demanding, wrathful God. He's not angry or vindictive. Jesus says, just ask. God wants to pour out blessings into your life. His desire is for your good. And he's a personal God. Jesus is describing a prayer language here. He's describing a prayer relationship that if we just ask, if we just seek him, if we just knock, if we engage in this conversation with God, that he hears us. Now, a lot of you have begun your relationship with Christ, and, and you know what this, this is like. Maybe at, at first this prayer was, was kind of awkward for you, but you've known over time, the more you pray, the more intimate you feel with God. Why? Because he longs to have a relationship with you, that as we get to know him, he just wants to pour out blessings into our lives. He's a personal God. He is a loving God. He's generous. He's so extravagantly good. He just, he longs to pour out these good things in our life and he wants us to do it. He's like a loving father, a father who knows our needs and who wants to give them to us. Now, some of us in this room may not know what it's like to have a loving father. Maybe your father didn't really give you a whole lot of good gifts. Uh, and maybe if he ever did give you gifts, it was begrudgingly, um, or he did it just to get you out of his hair. That is not the kind of God we serve. That is not the kind of heavenly father we have. The heavenly father we have wants to know you. He has unconditional love for you. Just like in that moment where your son or your daughter first enters the world and they have done nothing to earn your love, but yet you still just are crazy about this little human being because they are yours. That's God's attitude towards us all the time. No matter what you've done, no matter where you have been, you can't earn God's love. It's just there. He's a crazy God because he loves you unconditionally. Now, you might ask, how do I know that? I mean, the world I live in right now tells me the opposite. This isn't a fun world. There's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of mess out there. How do I know that God actually wants to engage a personal relationship with me and that he wants my best? How do I even know that? Well, the evidence comes about 2,000 years ago, and the evidence is reigning on the throne right next to the right hand of God. The evidence of God's personal love for you and the way that he wants to lavishly pour out good gifts to you is evidence in the fact that God was not content to stay in heaven. 
when we were lost in our sin and when we had a broken, rebellious relationship with God, when we had broken those ties with him, God was not content to just sit at a distance and judge us and condemn us and throw us away. Now, scripture says Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn. He came to save the world by grace. God, superior with all of his power, all of his privilege, all of his comfort, stepped out of that, took on human flesh, lived among us, and gave us life. He not only did that, but he was willing to go through abuse and suffering and all sorts of awful things just because he cared about us. And ultimately, he hung on a cross and bore our sin, nailing it there, accused as a criminal. Because this is what love does. Love is active and it's pursuing us. It steps into the mess and says, I'm going to care for you. I'm not going to judge you in a condemning manner. I'm going to engage a relationship with you because I care about you. This is the kind of relationship that God wants to have with us. And so in light of that, Jesus gives us the command to judge correctly, to seek the good of others. Verse 12. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Do unto others what you would have them do to you. This is the famous golden rule, right? Now, some people look at this golden rule and they say, yeah, well, you know, this isn't unique to Jesus. Uh, all sorts of religions and philosophies have claimed the same kind of truth. In fact, 100 years prior to Jesus, there was a rabbi in, in Jewish uh, circles who came up with something extremely similar. That rabbi by the name of Rabbi Hillel said, don't do to your neighbor what's hateful to you. Don't do to your neighbor what's hateful to you. So this isn't unique to Jesus. This is just something we all should abide by. But there's actually an enormous difference between the two. One is said in the negative, one is said in the positive, and it changes everything, everything. Jesus was the, was the first one to say, do unto others what you would have them do to you, not do not do what is hateful to others. There's a huge difference between this. Because when you see someone who's, who's living in a difficult circumstance, someone who's, who's got a mess around them, and you just say, well, I'm not going to judge them, and I'm just not going to do to them what, they wouldn't wanna, what I wouldn't want to have done to me, there's a passivity there. There's a self-centeredness there that says, I'm not going to engage that, and I'm just not going to do anything bad. This is the same kind of passivity that happened actually around World War II during the Holocaust uh, when the church idly of Germany, the, the church idly stood by while the Nazi camp was, was bringing all sorts of Jews and, and people who were against the state into concentration camps. The church just kind of stood by and said, well, we're not going to engage this because that's, that's a little too messy. I don't want to do that. They stood idly by saying, I'm not going to judge, while other people were getting carried off and being put into these horrible concentration camps. That's passivity. Jesus doesn't want that. He wants a love that's active, not passive. And so there were some in Nazi Germany who spent their lives caring for the Jews, caring for people who couldn't care for themselves. People like Corrie Ten Boom and her family who had took Jews and, and hide them in her house so that the, the Nazis wouldn't find them, knowing full well that it, it was at the risk of their own lives, that they could be carried off into the concentration camps themselves. And eventually, half of her family did and half of her family died. But it's a love that says, Jesus has so loved me he has given me an everlasting relationship of unconditional love. And so I am compelled to be vulnerable and to jump into other people's lives to help them. Because we judge correctly when we seek the good of others. Do you catch how Jesus does that? He knows that we're, we're faulty people, that we're broken, that we need help. But Jesus wasn't content to just judge at a distance. And neither are so many believers who see things that are wrong. Instead, they jump into the mess. They, they embrace vulnerability and they say, I'm going to care. I'm going to jump into the mess and I'm going to walk with people and help them because we judge correctly when we seek the good of others. Brothers and sisters, maybe there's someone in your life that you are tempted to judge harshly. Maybe there's someone that just gets underneath your fingernails. Maybe there's some people that just really conflict with you their thoughts and their behaviors and their beliefs, it's just always at a conflict. I want you to look at that person in your mind today. I want you to think about them and ask yourself, what can I do to love that person today? What can I do to seek their good? How can I jump into the mess even when it hurts? And how can I care for them with the love of Jesus? Because Jesus gave us everything. 
even his own life, to reconcile a relationship with us when we were dead in our sins. This is the kind of action he calls us to. And this is what we need to embrace today. Would you pray with me? Father God, this is a a vulnerable calling that you've given us. It's a difficult calling because we do live in a broken world where there is inevitable conflicts and these conflicts can really hurt. You're pretty clear in your word here, God, that we can't change a life. And so there are some that are going to be abusive and some that are going to reject your, your gospel and we need to just entrust them into your hands. But Father, there are so many people from whom we just stand on the sidelines and we're content to just not judge and we're not willing to vulnerably enter their lives with the kind of active love that you require, the kind of active love that you gave us. So I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would give us your love. You would infuse us, God, so much with your love that your compassion would overflow out of our lives to the people around us. Give us that strength, God, because we don't have it in and of ourselves. We're far too weak for that. So we pray, Father, that you would do that great work today and that you would do it, Lord, for your glory and for the benefit of others. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.